Well, good evening, Katie. How are you doing? Excellent. Thank it's you. It's great to be with Ned, and I have the great opportunity to watch Ned quite a little, and you're doing a splendid job. Please tell everyone at home how proud we are of you, okay? Thank you. Thank you. So here we are. I'm Edward Cardinal Egan. As you know, I'm a retired Archbishop of New York. Mm -hmm. And about six years ago, I worked out the creation of this wonderful Catholic center here. Mm -hmm. NYU, New York University, is the largest Catholic university in America. Now, you say it's not a Catholic university, but it has the biggest number of mm -hmm. Catholic students of any university in the mm -hmm. country. And so it was terribly important that we be here, that the church be here, and that the church be here right in the middle. We're right next to the main administration building in Washington Square. Mm -hmm. Years ago, they called Washington Square the crossroads of the world. And you probably have seen the beautiful arch mm -hmm. that was built in honor of George Washington, and this is a lovely, lovely part of lower New York, of uh, this beautiful city of ours. Just a few blocks away, Katie, is mm -hmm. a parish, mm -hmm. and it's a wonderful, thriving parish, mm -hmm. which we call the University Parish of St. Joseph's, mm -hmm. and it has a great Dominican pastor, Father McGuire, who worked with me in the creation of this edifice. And it also has living there uh, two priests who are full-time chaplains for this center, which is called the Edward Cardinal Catholic Center, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm the Edward Cardinal Egan that <laughs> it is named for. Uh, we are here on this campus present to be sure that Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is celebrated here every day, in fact, a couple of times a day, mm -hmm. that we have confession and all of these sacraments available to the students mm -hmm. and to the faculty and to the visitors and to anyone that comes along. In light of Pope Francis's popularity and a spreading persecution of Christians, what do you think the future of the faith community is in the world? Well, I think the future depends upon us. I believe that the future of the Catholic Church depends on what's going on in our parishes. That's the church up close. If we explain Catholic doctrine, if we explain Catholic philosophy, the reasons for our positions and so forth, in the local parish, to our local people, through our pastors, priests, religious parish staffs, we will make progress. If we simply speak to the media, or speak to the university community, we're not going to grow, we're not going to get strong. I have no worry about the future. I have no worry that our message will get over and is getting over to the extent that our parishes are strong and that our parish staffs are clear about Catholic doctrine, the reason for it, and can explain it to the Catholic people. If that happens, don't be the slightest bit concerned. And tonight when I'm speaking with a rabbi, I will say the same thing is true of the Jewish congregations. I listened a few days ago on uh, the Google uh, to a lecture by uh, the rabbi, Rabbi Sachs. There were six points in the lecture, and every one of them, is a point that I taught for years in moral theology in Rome. There wasn't one word different from what I would have said in class. So if we were to have in New York the communities of faith that are parishes, the communities of faith that are Jewish congregations, properly educated, formed with the Catholic intellectual life and what the rabbi had just said, which is identical. The rabbi in this talk, I listened to several, but one of them he gave in London, uh, he starts with the existence of God. He goes on with the dignity of the human person. He goes on with conscience and sin. And he brings up abortion as a great sin. He talks about 
the basic rules for peace. He talks about not depending only about the streets and the politicians and the media, but getting to the people where they are. My goodness, I could have given the whole talk and just sat there and uh, smiled. So in this particular case, he's an orthodox rabbi. He's not reform, he's not conservative, he's what they call orthodox, which would be the basic, uh, more, shall we say, conservative Jewish bent. And so uh, the issue about whether or not we are getting the story across, the reasons for what we espouse, well, I'm not worried if and only if we are strengthening our parishes and being sure that the parishes are delivering the message. Now, recently, Cardinal Burke said some really harsh criticism of President Obama, saying that he is limiting our freedom of religion to freedom of worship. Now, do you agree with that? Well, I didn't see that. I, I uh, know Cardinal Burke, and I wouldn't want to comment on the statement. But I believe here in the United States of America, we're a pretty free people. And uh, if we stand for what we stand for, if we have our people well-trained and if the arguments for where we stand are clear because the pastors and the parishes and the congregations are making it so, I wouldn't be the slightest bit concerned. In my years as archbishop, you know, I never got into anything political unless it were clearly and primarily and first and foremost a matter of morality. So for instance, uh, suicide. I know that it has a political side too because you can vote in favor of it in a legislature and so forth, but it's basically an ethical or a moral issue. The same thing is true about uh, the uh, question of monogamy. Uh, only one man and one woman and so forth and they forever. I can make that argument and need to make it in my parishes. I can make it in the New York Post if I want, but it won't make much difference. It'll make a difference if I have our pastors and our people clear on it and knowing how to articulate it. So my concern would be that uh, the Catholic teaching that Holy Fathers and the Council and the documents have uh, given us we can take care of it very well. And I wouldn't be too worried about the politicians trying to undermine it. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, I think, that uh, our president has asked to see the Holy Father when he's going to be in Rome. Uh, and uh, I did not see the talk that you're talking about. But again, I'm not concerned. This is a free country. We can defend ourselves, and we do, and we always will. Sure, the health care mandate, I think we're defending ourselves very well. I believe, if you want to know how I think it's going to work out or how it should, we have a law that makes it very clear that the government can never force someone to act against his religious beliefs unless there is an overriding demand by society. Society would be damaged. Well, now, if you think society be damaged, if we didn't provide uh, insurance for condoms, I'm sorry. Uh, you can get them. Here, I imagine that they're free on every corner. And if they're not free, they cost practically nothing. And so to say that there's an overriding, that society would collapse if we didn't uh, pass them out free and everybody pass. It's just nonsense. Eh? So let's wait for the courts. This is a great country, and uh, this thing will work out. You don't think that we will be required to private? Let's see. I have, I'm not a prophet, but I certainly think that uh, we have legislation and interpretations of the Supreme Court that are very much on our side. Uh, the uh, Religious Restoration Act says that you may not force anyone to something that's against his or her conscience unless there's an overriding, compelling need of society. Well, does anybody in the world think that anybody has trouble finding a birth control here in the state of New York or anywhere in the United States of America? They give them away in our high schools. 
I'm sorry to report, in the public high schools. So I wouldn't be too... Let's wait and see what happens. But even with the pending lawsuits like the, the Sisters of the Poor and Hobby Lobby... Sure. That's right. They're all going to be decided by the courts, and I hope the courts say that there's no compelling reason. And let's see. Okay, great. Well, another um, another part of this this cardinal work, he he, you know, Cardinal Casper gave a large presentation about divorced and remarried Catholics mm -hmm. and saying that we should reform the way the um, annulment process, that it should be easier. And again, Cardinal Burke said, no, we shouldn't do that. What do you think about divorce and remarriage? Well, I was there, of course, and I spoke after it. I was one of the cardinals that spoke. And I think that Cardinal Casper felt, and I think most people felt, that he was very measured and very careful about what he said. Uh, he said that there's a problem, that there are so many people that are, divorced and remarried, and we would like in every way we can to come to their assistance. He did not propose anything radical, and if he did, you would know what it was, and I would too, but I sat there and listened to it. It was very long and uh, very, very carefully uh, nuanced so that no one could say that he was attacking any Catholic position. At least I didn't hear it that way, and I think that you'd be happy to know that the first day, uh, I was the only American, I think, who spoke. And uh, Cardinal Dolan uh, wrote to all the priests what I said. Do you want me to tell you what I said? I said, I'm not concerned about any of this if we are explaining to our pastors what we're doing, if we're adjusting anything, and giving them the reasons and being sure that they can share them with their people if we do that, I have no concern. And if you want to Google down Cardinal Dolan's statement on this and what I had to say, I think you'll find that I wasn't upset, and I don't think he was either. Okay. So then why the sharp criticism? I didn't think there was. Well, you say there was a sharp criticism. I didn't see one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So you, what you're saying is either way, whether there's reforms or not, that will be okay? I'm saying that the church will work this out. I don't know how, and Cardinal Casper said he didn't know how either. And uh, whatever the way we work it out will be interpreted well through our parishes, say I. If we don't interpret it well through the parishes, then it's going to be what's ever on the front page of whatever newspaper wants to say something that takes a certain amount of thought in 75 words, and then you just have the tragedy of uh, misunderstanding. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, Pope Francis just announced a new commission to work on the sex abuse scandals, and it's, it contains, you know, more laity than clergy. Of course. What do you think about that? I think that's the way it should be. I, uh, in, first of all, to make it clear, during my years in the Diocese of Bridgeport and during my years in the Archdiocese of New York, there's not even an accusation of one case of this abuse. To get that clear, some people, the newspapers don't like to admit that. But if there were one, you'd know the name of the priest and you'd know the name of the child. None. And I've been a bishop a long time, eh? Uh, so I, I have no... Uh, none of these cases. I had to pick up my predecessor's cases and handle them well in Bridgeport and also here. But I've never had one at all. And uh, the way I handled them there and here was with a board that was overwhelmingly laity. So when I hear the newspapers get all bent out of shape because the Holy Father has laity on such a board, well, I'm sure that your diocese has a review board that's overwhelmingly laity. I had one in Connecticut, and I had one in New York, and Cardinal Dolan has the same one I have, and I, I'm sure that it's probably 75% laity. 
So uh, let's not get upset. But this is a pretty new thing for the Vatican. Well, the Vatican has never had any uh, kind of a, uh, a review board. Mm -hmm. And so they, they just installed one just like everybody else's. I put the review board in uh, how many years ago in Connecticut, and uh, as soon as I came here, uh, there was one already. Cardinal O'Connor had it. I made some adjustments as people got older and so forth, but it's overwhelmingly laity, and there's nothing. See, this is why it's so important. You read these little things in the newspaper, and you mention scandal and so forth. Uh, please. Uh, Let's be sure that all of this is well explained in our parishes, and when somebody calls that a scandal, the people laugh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really, the laugh would be the best medicine for a lot of this. But go on, go on. Well, do you think that, I mean, he's appointing women, just like he's been promising women to be in leadership roles of the church. Is this new commission one of the defining parts of I, I just think that, you know, we've all got to get a sense of humor. Uh, women have been more operative in the Catholic Church than men. I went to an elementary school in Oak Park, Illinois, St. Giles, where there were 30 nuns running the school. My uncles were doctors in Oak Park, Illinois, at Oak Park Hospital, and it was run by all sisters from French Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, the sisters have founded universities, hospitals, and so forth. It, let me remind you, Mother Seton wisely came to New York, the center of the world, and got her inspiration for Catholic education here. John Neumann came to New York. They pretend he's from Philadelphia. He came to New York, became one of ours, and learned the importance of education in New York. And there was Mother Cabrini came here. She founded hospitals. and to, It's just laughable. Women have been running the church for a long, long time, and they do it very 